Materials and lighting are really fun to work with, and they help our models look their best. The shaders, which make up a material, tell the render engine how light should interact with the object, what colors it should absorb or reflect, how diffuse or shiny it should be, or how transparent it is. Let's start exploring them by adding a basic material to our default cube. Let's go to the Material tab in the Properties Editor, which is the red checker circle. In the Surface panel, you'll see the default shader and all of its parameters. Now, there are a lot of settings in here, and we definitely don't have time to go over all of them now, but even just changing a few of the most important ones will get you most of the way. First, of course, there's the base color, which is just the overall color of your object. I'll set this to a nice blue, but as you'll see, the cube in my viewport hasn't changed from its gray. That's because the super simple solid view renderer called Workbench doesn't have access to these advanced shaders. So to set the color in the viewport, we actually have to go down to Viewport Display and change the color here. I'll just drag and drop the same one from the base color. To see what our actual material looks like, let's head over to the Material Preview. Now, as we change any of these parameters, they'll be updated in our viewport. Now let's add another object with a different type of material. I'll hit Shift A and add a monkey, then hit 3 to go into Side View, zoom in, rotate, and scale this one to put Suzanne right on top of the cube. Now I want to make Suzanne made out of gold. So in the material properties, I'll click new to create a new material, though we could have used the drop down to set this to the first material, which I'll just rename blue here, but I don't want to use this one. So I'll go ahead and click the X to clear it out. Then I'll click new and I'll call this one gold. Then for the base color, I'll set it to a slightly more saturated tan, not too orange, but not too light either. That's the right color for gold, but this doesn't really look like a metal. Well, the main big difference between metals and non-metals is that metals tint their reflections while non-metals don't. All we need to do to get that effect is just go down to the metallic value and turn that all the way up to one. Then if we want to make it more shiny, we can go down to the roughness. The term roughness here is talking about how smooth or jagged the surface would be if you were to look at it under a microscope. So a really low roughness means that it's gonna be really shiny. Setting it to zero would make it a perfect mirror but I'll set it to something like 0.2. If you've got a handle on these three controls, then you'll be able to make the basics of most materials. Now, one of the things that you might've heard about Blender is that it has a pretty powerful procedural shader editor. If you're already familiar with a node-based workflow from other programs, then switch over to the shading workspace. And in the bottom, you'll find the shader editor. Head to the add menu and check out all of the different nodes that Blender has. We definitely don't have time to get into these here, but we will start to look at them in the next course and a lot more in the fundamentals courses. As a super quick example of how this works though, let's go down to the texture menu and choose Voronoi texture. This is a pattern that's mathematically generated and we could take the color result and plug that right into the base color. Then as we zoom in, we can see that it's generating a bunch of different cells of different colors on our mesh. If I increase the scale, then these cells get smaller and smaller. But the cool thing about working with nodes is that not only can we influence the base color, we could also influence things like the roughness. So some of these cells will appear really shiny and some of them will appear really soft. The resulting variation makes it look really sparkly, especially if I scale this way up. There's a ton to talk about when it comes to procedural materials, but I'll save that for the fundamentals. For now, I'll hit X to delete this node and let's head back to the layout workspace to talk about lighting. We already have a light in the default Blender scene, but we can't see its effects here. That's because we're in Material Preview mode, and by default, lights are turned off. We could turn them on if we go to the Material Preview dropdown and turn on Scene Lights here, but I want to leave this as a quick place to preview our materials. So instead, I'll go into Rendered View, and now we'll see exactly what would happen if we were to hit F12 and render this out. Suddenly, our gold looks a lot less like gold and a lot more flat and boring. Well, that's because it's a reflective material and just reflecting the background. And if the background's a flat gray, then of course it's not gonna be all that interesting to look at. So first, let's learn how to change the background. For that, we need to go to the World tab in the Properties Editor. And when the surface is set to background, then we can change the color and the strength. Though of course, all of these, no matter what we change it to, will just be a flat color. So it might be more colorful, but it'll still be flat. Instead of a flat background, let's plug in a sky texture. I'll click on this little dot that's next to the color which indicates a node input. Then under texture, I'll choose sky texture. Now, right out of the gate, this is going to be incredibly bright and it's going to wash out our materials because the sky is really bright. You can imagine if you were taking a photo inside and then you walked outside and took a photo of the sky without changing the settings on your camera, then of course your photo would be washed out as well. That's the same thing that's happening here. 
If we're working with really bright lights, then we'd want to change our exposure, but more on that later. The default texture, Nishida, uses values that are more or less physically accurate. So if we set our sun elevation to something that's really low, like 3, then we'll get these beautiful sunset colors. And while this provides a really nice and natural gradation, it's also still not giving our reflective object a whole lot of detail to reflect. So let's move on from the sky texture and look at adding an HDRI. So under Color, I'll click on Sky Texture, and instead switch that to an Environment Texture. Now the whole world's going to turn bright pink because it thinks that the texture is missing since we haven't loaded it up yet, so let's go ahead and click Open. Navigate to the source files for this course, and choose Kaylee Interior 2K. This is a texture that's from polyhaven.com, which is a really great place to go to get these world textures for lighting your scenes. And I'm not even saying that as a sponsor, you can go and download any of them for free. Polyhaven is entirely supported by donations and its Patreon, so I'd recommend chipping in or purchasing one of their add-ons if you find this resource useful. Now that we have lots of detail though, our reflections are going to be more interesting. For some reason the process of rotating your HDRI in Blender is a little convoluted, but I want to show you it here because it's probably one of the first things that you're going to want to do. So to rotate your HDRI, go to the vector input, vector meaning the directions for where each pixel shows up in 3D space, and then to change those directions we have to go to vector and mapping. Now your texture is going to completely disappear, but that's because we're not telling it which directions to transform just yet. So let's go down to this second vector input, left click on that node input, and choose the texture coordinate generated. All right, so that was kind of a lot, but now we have our image back, and we can go to rotation and rotate this around the Z. If you want, you can also change the location and scale, but that gets pretty weird pretty fast. If you're not seeing your background, it's probably because you have transparent still turned on from the last lesson. First of all, good for you for following along, and second of all, to turn that off, then just head to the render properties, down to film, and make sure that transparent is unchecked at least if you want to see your background. If you don't, then just turn that on. To actually render this out, I'll switch over from EV to Cycles, and I'll switch from CPU to GPU rendering, because otherwise my voice is going to be really choppy this whole time. All right, here we go. And to make sure that this isn't rendering for too long, I'm going to take the maximum samples here, which is the number of times that it calculates the light paths, and I'll set that to 10, at least in the viewport. For rendering, I'll set that to 100. That way it shouldn't take too long. Then I'll add a plane so we can see some of that nice bounce lighting. Shift A, Mesh and Plane, and I'll scale that up so it takes over most of the view. Then I'll move up the Cube and Suzanne so that they're sitting directly on top of the plane. And I'll set my camera at a better angle. I'll navigate to a view that I like, and then hit Control, Alt, and then 0 on the number pad to snap my camera to the view. Then to fine tune this, I'll select the camera from the outliner. And to zoom out, I'll hit G, click my middle mouse button in, and then move my mouse back. Then I'll hit G again to position it into place. I often like to see the real-time result of my render while also working in the 3D view. So what I'll do is I'll hover over the right border of the 3D viewport, right-click, and choose Vertical Split. Then I'll cut this viewport in half. This one on the left will be my rendered view. So I'll hide the toolbar with T, and turn off gizmos and overlays up in the header. Now I'd like to talk about lights, but I think rendering with cycles while also recording is going to be a little bit too much of a strain on my GPU, so I'll set this to EV just for now. Then let's select our light and look at its properties. Over in the light data properties, we can change its color, its strength, how it affects our materials, at least if we're in EV. If we're in cycles, then we won't really see this because it's not really a physical property. But most importantly, down here we have the radius. This controls the size of the light, which in turn controls how soft or sharp our shadows are. To see this better, I'll head over to the World tab and temporarily turn this off by scrolling down to Strength and setting that to zero. Then I'll head back to the Light Data Properties tab. The smaller the radius, the sharper the shadows, and the bigger the radius, the softer they are. That's because when the light's bigger, more of it's going to wrap around the object. We can also set this to be a spotlight, which behaves the same way but is limited to a cone. And that cone we can control in the spot shape. Here we can change the size, and also the softness of the falloff. There are also area lights, which if you increase the size, will show up as a flat plane. I like working with these because they're really flexible. We can set that to be a rectangle, 
a square, a disk, or an ellipse. We could also set this to be a sunlight, which by default is way too light because this is using different units, but it keeps the same number for some reason. So set that to something more like 10. And now it doesn't matter where you move this around because the only thing that matters is the angle. To change the angle, of course, we could rotate this with R, but we can also click and drag on this gizmo to point it at any object. For now though, I'll switch this back to a point light and set this back to 1000. Then I'll set the color to white and move it somewhere where it will complement our HDRI. I'll give it a nice light from the top right, head back to our world tab, turn the strength back to one, and then head back to the render properties and set the render engine to cycles. Now with cycles path tracing, this is looking pretty darn good. One point that I do want to make though, is that the quality of your final result not only depends on your materials and lighting, but also heavily on your models. There's only so much that materials and lighting can do. If we were to take our cube here, go to the modifiers tab and add modifier, and I'll just search for bevel and add that. And I'll just give it a really small bevel and increase the number of segments. Now, all of a sudden, the lighting on the edges of our cube look much more interesting. I didn't change the lighting though, I changed the geometry. Similarly, I could take our Suzanne here, add modifier and subdivision surface. I'll set that up to two, then right click in the 3D viewport and shade smooth. Now high poly versus low poly is a matter of preference. I do want you to notice though, how the smooth material suddenly looks a lot more metallic. So the look and feel of your shaders will be heavily influenced by not only the surrounding environment, but also the shape of the object. Now, lastly, you might find the colors of your materials to be a little bit too washed out in Blender. If that's the case, then head over to your render properties and all the way down to color management. By default, the look is set to none, which is pretty low in contrast. So to make your colors pop a little bit more, just set this to medium high contrast or high contrast. Then you can also change the overall brightness with the exposure. As we increase the exposure, notice how everything gets less saturated. This is the same way that our eyes work and how a camera works. So you can't have something that's both fully saturated and also fully bright. And one of the keys to getting good colors out of your render is setting the right exposure and making sure you have good lighting. Now, of course, all of these things are just skimming the surface of huge topics, which we could talk about for a while. So if you're interested in finding out more, check out the fundamentals courses on cgcookie.com where we dive into all of this. But even with just what you've learned from this video, you can now set up custom materials and custom lighting. So go ahead and try that out on your own and then get moving to the next lesson where we'll talk about getting things moving with animation.